Okay, good morning and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this RSET webinar series on urban flood monitoring using remote sensing observations. Uh, I'm Amita Mehta and uh, we will be conducting this webinar sessions with my colleague, Dr. Erika Portes from NASA JPL. So overall training objectives, um, it's going to focus on remote sensing and earth system model data and tools which are relevant for monitoring urban flooding, especially for planning warning, response, and recovery phases when a flood occurs. Secondly, we also want to identify main challenges in monitoring urban flooding, especially using remote sensing data. So the overall objective would be to learn about remote sensing data and identify remote sensing data that are relevant, but also see what are the limitations or challenges in using this data and how to overcome them partially. So course outline is there are going to be two sessions, as you may know. Um, today, it's going to be overview of remote sensing data for urban flooding. So we will mostly talk about different types of data that can be used for different phases of urban flooding. And next week, then, we're going to focus on access analysis of remote sensing observations uh, for specific cases. And also, we're going to focus on flood monitoring tools, which can aid uh, to look at or monitoring uh, urban areas and see where surface inundation is occurring. As shown here in the image, this is from Lancet and MODIS. And you can see that uh, the, the areas uh, from Modis and uh, Lancet, shown here in purple and red, they show uh, surfaces where there is water. So we're going to look at different aspects of urban flooding, starting with uh, which data to use, which we'll cover today. And then next time, then we'll use uh, some of flood tools, which can directly give information about where inundation may be occurring. Just a few um, things to note about this uh, webinar series. Uh, there will be two homeworks, uh, simple homeworks uh, today as well as after the second session. And uh, there will be a certificate of completion awarded to everyone who attends both webinars uh, and also complete homework assignments by the deadline, which is 15th of August. Um, and uh, by this time, you have to submit both the assignments. Um, you will receive the certificate approximately up two months after the completion of the course. And Marina Martins, whose email address is given here, uh, will be sending you an e-copy of your certificate, provided that you attend both this webinar and complete homework sessions. That brings us to today's session. Um, our plan overall is here. We'll start with something about RSET. Some of you may already have taken RSET trainings before and are familiar with RSET, but those of you who are new to RSET, we want to um, say a few words about RSET. We'll start with that. And then we will start talking about urban flooding. First of all, why is it different than any other flooding, uh, which is non-urban flooding? Then we'll focus on how to monitor urban flooding using remote sensing and uh, observations and earth system model data. Um, also, we will focus today um, on anal analysis of terrain to detect flood-prone flood area, sorry, and also monitoring approaching precipitation or weather systems. So that's going to be the focus for today um, before we move into talking about flood monitoring tools. Then we will move on to examples of urban flood management using remote sensing. We'll show some examples where uh, several organizations are using remote sensing data for urban flood management. Then we will have demonstration of two flood cases. And in this two cases, one is Ellicott City, Maryland. Uh, this was a flash flood occurred um, in, in May of this year. And in Houston, Texas, there was also very heavy rain and that caused flooding on 4th of July. So we'll focus on these two flood cases at the end and we'll demonstrate how to look at terrain data and how to uh, identify where there are flood prone areas in within this urban uh, uh, cities and also uh, see how uh, we can monitor precipitation before actually flash flood occurs or 
uh, just to see how to look at urban area and surrounding area to see if there is a flood approaching. And once the flood occurs, uh, where there may be uh, water logging occurring. So this, this is the overall outline. We'll start with RSET. So about RSET, uh, here is the website. Um, and those of you who you have taken this training, you already know this, but major objective of RSET is to empower global community through remote sensing training, especially um, we do trainings, as you see, uh, to increase the use of earth science in decision making through training. And we focus on um, training for policymakers, environmental managers, and other professionals so that remote sensing data can be used for uh, decision making. Um, RSET is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. And the topics that we cover, they include water resources, disasters, eco management and air quality. These are, we do thematic trainings on these four themes. Here is the RSET website and there is also um, listserv where you can sign up. Uh, all the training material is available here, all the past trainings as well as come trainings. When um, we post homework or exercises, they will also be posted on this website and you can sign up for the listserv if you have not already done so. Uh, once you sign up, you will receive information about upcoming trainings or any news um, that uh, are coming from our set. You can see that uh, you will receive an email. So that was about our set. And now we want to start talking about urban flooding. Um, also, please um, we'll take a minute here uh, for you to type in the chat box have you attended RSET trainings before? Uh, you can just say yes or no. And also, have you attended tropical storms training earlier? You can also type this answer in the chat box. So now we'll start with urban flooding. So what are the causes of urban flooding? Anywhere you see flooding basically occurs uh, because there is excessive rainfall. Uh, anywhere it is true, but in urban flooding, there are natural and human induced causes and they're listed here. First of all, heavy precipitation um, can cause flash floods uh, anywhere, but in urban area, um, it's very important. Um, they can also occur because of snow melt that snow melt runoff can inundate surfaces. Uh, urban area close to a river can be flooded if even if there is no heavy rain in the urban area, but upstream if there is heavy rain and river starts flooding, then overbank flow can inundate a uh, nearby urban area. That could be a cause. Uh, coastal flooding can occur because of storm surges and if, and if the sea level is slowly rising, that can also increase chances of coastal flooding. So urban area, even if there is no heavy rain, if it's near the coast and there is a storm approaching, a coastal area can get flooded. But there are also reasons listed here. First of all, lack of proper drainage systems. Any urban area has a, usually they have storm um, water system and the capacity of that system decides how much water can be quickly removed from the urban area. So if the drainage system cannot handle all the precipitation that is coming in, in efficiently removing it, then there is usually flooding. If there is no water infiltration in the ground, because there is a lot of built up areas such as roads and buildings and parking lots, then surface becomes impermeable. So outside the urban area where there is open land, usually water runs off or it also gets infiltrated in the ground. It seeps in the, uh, in the soil. If the area is built, then that uh, water cannot go into the ground and it just stays on the surface. So that also can cause flooding. So unplanned development 
actually um, is a major cause of urban flooding. Um, not only it increases impermeable surface so that water cannot go into the ground, but also it sometimes if it is not planned properly, then the terrain changes in such a way or uh, the uh, water has no way to go to the uh, sewage or drainage system and then water gets accumulated in a particular place. And that causes water logging or ponding or urban flooding. There could be infrastructure failure if there are dams or levees nearby and if they burst or even uh, drainage pipes, they burst, then uh, water leaks out and then there could be flooding also. So there is natural uh, cause of flooding, uh, which is basically heavy precipitation or riverine flood or coastal storm surge uh, because of that. Or there, in addition, these are other factors which play a major role in deciding um, intensity and location of urban flooding. So together, all these factors, when they come together, uh, that could be urban flood that could be really bad. As you can see, the flash flood in Ellicott City, Maryland, uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, was such a flash flood resulting from heavy rain. We are going to look at this flood case later, but it really, really uh, flooded a particular area of the city. And you can see uh, all the cars in the water, and there was uh, not enough um, um, drainage system design could not handle uh, removal of the water. Similarly, this is um, in Philippines, you can see uh, major flooding, which is not only because of rainfall, but also because of the coastal uh, storm surge that occurred and then that flooded the city. And obviously, uh, urban flood risks are greater because it, they're usually populated areas, so there is major danger to uh, human lives, damages to buildings, housing, roads, utility works, drainage systems. Um, they also are at risk. Uh, there are direct economic impacts such as income losses in industries and, and trade, uh, loss of household assets, loss of employment for daily workers. Um, so these are direct in economic impact. In addition, there could be infrastructure damage that needs repairing, and so there are long-lasting economic impacts as well. Uh, here, uh, the schematic is shown where uh, there are sources of flooding, and then there are pathways, and then how uh, different systems are affected, and what are the consequences. So uh, urban flood uh, has risks which are immediate, and also they are longer-lasting. So uh, it's not only uh, that there needs to be response and recovery in the immediate aftermath of flooding, but there has to be mitigate, mitigation efforts. They have to be thought of to um, reduce long-term impact of urban flooding. So why is it important? Not just because it is, um, it, it is really risk for human lives and everything. But something else to note is that uh, there's projections that by 2050, two thirds of the world's population will be living in urban areas. Even now, cities are always growing and that's going to continue. And so in a few years, in 20, 30 years, uh, most of the people in the world will be living in urban areas. So rapid and unplanned increase in urbanization, growing number of slum dwellers, um, and inadequate infrastructure will make cities more and more vulnerable. So, and they will uh, affect quality of life for people, ecosystem systems will be affected, and also a lot of economic impacts, and they will be uh, vulnerable more than even now. So that's why it's important to understand urban flooding. Um, as some of you know, the United Nations has um, sustainable development goals. And uh, for sustainable cities, so there are specific SDGs, as they're called, um, they focus on making cities uh, and communities sustainable. And specific um, indicators or goals are 11.B.2, um, have strategies for urban disaster reduction. 
Uh, next one is reduce the number of deaths related to disasters and 15.5.2 mitigate disaster damage to infrastructure for basic services. So this by 2030 and beyond, some of these goals have to be kept in mind. And so uh, whatever steps can be taken to reduce uh, disaster risk um, and make cities and communities more sustainable, that should be the goal. Uh, so, and as uh, stated here, it is both natural and human development the factors they influence cities and coping with flooding and in expanding urban areas with increasing population and it's going to be a major challenge for decision makers not at community level or municipality level but also at state level and national level and even international level where disasters can have major economic impacts um, and long-lasting effects. So it is really important to focus on um, urban areas and see how to uh, work with urban flooding in, in decision making. Uh, can we see um, upcoming flood? Can we identify areas which are flood prone? Can, can there be infrastructure in place or services in place uh, for decision makers to, uh, to, to work with or to respond to urban flooding? So there are data needs for that, and for urban flood risk reduction in for for natural causes, you first of all have to identify floodplain, um, and so floodplain maps uh, they uh, are based on terrain or digital elevation model or DEMs, and also uh, what kind of drainage channels are there, uh, natural way of water to flow away from a particular area. So those have to be known. Um, if it's a river in flood, then river stages and inundation have to be known. Is the stream flow high enough so that there will be overbank flow uh, and cities will be uh, flooded close by? So stream flow and river stage, they have to be known. Uh, coastal surges and inundation, so that requires um, surge height monitoring and also uh, inundation occurring because of that. There is weather data, especially precipitation, intensity, and frequency. And forecast would help to see where there is major precipitation or weather system approaching, and that might prepare urban areas um, for, for uh, flood risk reduction. Also, flood hazard map and written periods. These are uh, developed based on pres past precipitation and river stage data. Um, so that they can be calculated from other data sets. In addition, there are anthropogenic or human um, data needs for flood risk reduction. So stormwater system design and its capacity. So these data, if for planning for urban flood, um, it has to be known what kind of uh, capacity is there for a stormwater system to remove the water. Um, then design and capacity of dams and levees, if it's relevant uh, for any urban area. Uh, land use change, so this is exposed soil versus built area. Uh, so impermeable area versus non-impermeable area, so that water can be removed um, in the ground. Uh, that uh, has to be known. Uh, human population and infrastructure, infrastructure such as buildings and roads um, and other infrastructure, this information also helps in, in reducing uh, urban flood risk. So together all these factors can help in reducing urban flood risk. And uh, remote sensing actually can help in, in many of these um, uh, data. So as you can see, it's the stormwater and design and dams and levy design. They are something very specific, but all other uh, factors listed here, uh, natural and some of the anthropogenic, they can be accessed through remote sensing data. And that is what we are going to see next. So 
So uh, for that, we're going to start with uh, monitoring urban flooding, what kind of NASA remote sensing and Earth system model data and tools are available. Uh, these tools that we're going to talk about today are mostly for data access. So, so, so we're going to start with a number of satellites um, that NASA has in orbit. Uh, these satellites are relevant for monitoring urban flooding. Um, it should be noted that it's not just urban flooding. It, these satellites are relevant for monitoring flooding anywhere, but we are going to focus on urban areas and how to use data from these satellites to monitor urban areas and flooding in particular. Um, very useful satellite system, Landsat, uh, which is the longest uh, flying satellite uh, series of satellite systems. Um, and that started in July 72, and uh, Landsat 8 is the current satellite that is already flying. Uh, tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission. This uh, satellite was designed specifically to monitor tropical rainfall, and that was launched in November 97. It ended in April 2015, but as we will see later, uh, rainfall from this satellite has been used for so many applications, especially flood-related applications, that uh, these data in one form are still continuing uh, with uh, climatological trim calibration. Um, and so that's why we're going to include this satellite, although it's no longer flying right now. Uh, next, uh, satellite global precipitation measurement mission. This GPM is a follow-up mission to TRIM, and that was launched in February of 2014, and it is um, currently flying and providing uh, global precipitation that uh, is highly accurate and relatively high resolution compared to previous satellites. Uh, Terra and Aqua, these two satellites are also are uh, long flying uh, since 1999 and 2002 respectively. Uh, and we will see how these satellites can help in um, monitoring urban flooding. Um, relatively recent satellites, SUMI National Polar Orbiting Partnership or SNPP, that was launched in 2011 and it's been flying. Uh, the instrument on SNPP are similar uh, to that on Terra and Aqua as we will see, and they also help in monitoring flooding. Soil Moisture Active Passive, uh, that was launched in 2015 and it's been flying. Um, that provides information about soil moisture. Um, and as we will see, that also is useful in indicating where flood severity might be more. There are additional um, uh, data satellites. One is from European Space Agency, Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B. These two systems, uh, they've been flying since 2014 and 16, respectively. And as we will see, um, Sentinel-1A and 1B, they carry uh, radar, uh, synthetic aperture radar that help in monitoring uh, land surface and flooding. Um, finally, there is a sh shuttle radar topography mission, or SRTM, that was flown in 2001 on a space shuttle. And that collected uh, radar-based information of Earth's topography. And that is very useful in identifying flood-prone areas. So that is um, also a uh, very useful data set. So these are all the satellites that help in monitor urban flooding. Here is a table of all the satellites that we just talked about and uh, sensors carried by these satellites. Um, measurements, uh, either emitted or reflected radiation that is measured by these instruments and the parameters derived from these instruments. So all the acronyms are defined at the end, but we're gonna talk about uh, Landsat 7 and 8, which are currently flying. They have sensors such as Enhanced Thematic Mapper and Operational Land Imager, or OLI. Um, they uh, measure optical reflectance, so visible, near-infrared, middle-infrared, and thermal-infrared. Um, and these reflectance and images, they can uh, be used to derive land cover, and that's why specifically they can be used to look at inundated surface. TRIM and GPM, these two satellites, they carry microwave radiometer and radar. 
So TRIM has TRIM microwave imager, uh, GPM has GPM microwave imager, precipitation radar, and dual frequency precipitation radar. These are the frequencies for TMI and GMI in microwave uh, frequency. These are in gigahertz. And these are the radar frequencies. PR was just KU band, and DPR has both KU and KA band. And all these measurements are used to derive precipitation um, at the surface and also how uh, water molecules are distributed in the vertical that also is derived from these satellites. Okay. So Terra and Aqua, these two satellites have many instruments, but the one we're going to talk about is MODIS or Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer. Um, SNPP, VIRS has, is also very similar to MODIS, and both these instruments, they uh, measure uh, reflectance in visible, near infrared, and middle infrared. And these reflectances and uh, images, they can look at different lens cover and therefore can also be used to identify inundated surface. Soil moisture active passive earth map has a microwave radiometer currently flying on the satellite, has L-band uh, microwave frequency, um, and it provides soil moisture um, uh, at the surface. And uh, combined with the model, it also provides root zone soil moisture. Central 1 and B, these are ASA, or European Space Agency satellites. They have synthetic aperture radar, which is a C-band microwave radar. And it provides backscattered um, radiation that can be used to look at inundated surface. Finally, Space Shuttle Endeavour carried SRTM. Again, that was a radar, or C-band radar, and that uh, provided um, information about Earth's terrain. In addition, uh, there is a NASA model. It's called Earth System Model, or it's a Goddard Earth Observing System 5. And this model uh, provides precipitation, winds, and soil moisture information that can be used in near real time. Also, there is forecast available on hourly basis that can be used to monitor weather system. There are two additional uh, data sets that we want to talk about. LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging. Um, that's a uh, instrument, also a remote sensing instrument that we will see next week, provides high resolution topography mapping. And that's why it is very useful for urban regions where um, you have buildings and other obstacles that uh, needs high resolution observations and LIDAR can help do that. Then finally, there is CDAC or socioeconomic data center that provides a number of socioeconomic data um, in urban area, uh, specifically that can help in uh, urban flood management. So we are going to look at different uh, data sets today. Um, we'll start with Landsat uh, satellites. So as uh, we mentioned, Landsat 7 and 8 are flying currently, and Landsat 9 is already uh, planned. So this is a long-term mission. Uh, it has, Landsat 7 has uh, enhanced thematic mapper. Um, and all the, what is important to note here is that with different optical and infrared bands here, the resolution is relatively high here. It's 15 meters, 30 meters to 60 meters, or 30 meters um, in, in for most bands. Um, however, you look at the revisit time, it is 16 day. So at any given location, every 16 day, you can get lens at image. And also the swath is about 185 kilometers. The next instrument is operational land imager. This is flying on Landsat 8, has nine bands, again, basically covering optical and infrared uh, region, and has similar spatial resolution and temporal resolution. So this also is used for looking at uh, inundated surface. So where can you get Landsat images and spectral reflectance data? So there are three options here. 
as you can see, USGS has uh, Earth Explorer. Um, this portal allows you to do special temporal subsetting and picking a particular area for a Landsat image. Similarly, there is Global Visualization Viewer or Globis that also helps in picking individual tiles in which you can look at uh, Landsat images. So true color images can be seen or all band reflectance data can also be obtained from these sites. Similarly, uh, USGS Land Look Viewer also helps in, in accessing data. Uh, personally, uh, for global data, uh, I have always used Earth Explorer, but uh, you can try the, these uh, different locations and see uh, it's pretty easy to navigate um, through these sites. And RSET also has uh, several trainings in which these data have been used. So if you go to RSET website in, in uh, land management or eco forecasting um, webinars, you will see uh, some of these websites being accessed. This brings us to uh, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, as uh, this is the currently flying mission, which is a follow-up of Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission Trim. Um, you can see the orbits shown in yellow are trim orbits, and the blue are GPM orbits. So as I mentioned earlier, trim focused on tropics between 35 south to 35 north, whereas GPM provides observations between 65 south to 65 north, essentially covering uh, major um, precipitation areas, both rain and snow. And um, GPM, um, uh, has, it works with a number of national, international satellites or constellation satellites, and combined with these other satellites, revisit time is two to four hours. So that's um, a useful uh, system to monitor precipitation. And these are the sensors, as we mentioned earlier. So both TRIM and GPM, they use the concept of multi-satellite algorithms. Um, they TRIM and GPM core satellites were flown by NASA and JAXA, which is Japanese Space Agency. But these satellite data were combined with other constellation satellites, uh, both national and international satellites, all carrying uh, microwave or infrared observations instruments. And so by combining these different satellite data calibrated with TRIM and GPM that allowed improved spatial and temporal coverage for precipitation. And so one such multi-satellite algorithm from TRIM, it's called TRIM Multi-Satellite Precipitation Analysis, or TMPA, uh, that um, has been used for many applications. Uh, similarly, um, there is an algorithm with GPM. It's called Integrated Multi-Satellite Retrievals for GPM, or iMERGE. And this is similar to TMPA, but currently it has better resolution than TMPA. Later this year, a combined trim GPM record will be available uh, to have multi-satellite algorithms. And as shown here, um, these, that's the GPM core, and these are the national international satellites from uh, US, from Japan, from uh, India, and France, and you know, European um, Space Agency. So these um, satellites, they help um, they're calibrated with GPM satellite observations, and they're all combined finally with rain gauge data overland to come up with iMERGE. And you can find more information on this website. So iMERGE, uh, which uh, will be a long-term uh, product eventually starting from uh, 1998 onwards uh, combined with Trim TMPA currently has three versions as shown here. There is early uh, product, which has latency of about five hours. And this is very useful for monitoring flash flooding. Uh, late uh, product, which has latency of about 15 hours. And that is more for looking at uh, crop forecasting or where to water um, uh, crops. 
And then there is final, which is the research quality data. It, it has latency of three months, so you receive it three months later. Uh, but it is combined with rain gauge data. And all these data are available at uh, hourly, uh, half hourly, uh, three hourly, one day, three day, and seven day, and for different applications. And eventually, uh, IMRS data will be available globally at half hourly um, interval. And so, Focusing on iMERGE, it is one-tenth of a degree resolution compared to earlier availability of satellite bit precipitation like TMPA. Um, and um, it's half hourly, and eventually um, it will be available uh, from 98 onwards. So TMPA, as I mentioned, is widely used for flood modeling and monitoring, and iMERGE is going to replace this product in the near future. So where to get iMERGE um, or trim and GPM data? Uh, here is the website. This is the precipitation measurement mission website, and there's a data access link. Um, and there's a quick link to get data. And there's also a training on how to obtain this data. The link is provided here. So you can um, download data or you can visualize this data. What we are going to do is we're going to use a tool. It's called Giovanni. And this is um, the website. Uh, those of you who have taken our set classes, courses before, they are familiar with Giovanni, um, I'm sure. And then what we will do is go through Giovanni tool to see how to access precipitation data and how to analyze this precipitation data, especially in context of urban flooding. Um, we will have a demonstration of this tool later, but as you can see, you can search by keyword. There is special and temporal selection available. There are different analysis options available, and um, this can you can pick either by drawing let lawn box or you can pick different shape files uh, for analysis. So we will have a demo at the end. This provides um, I'm sorry. This provides I um, merge data um, analysis uh, capability, and that that is what we are going to see. The next satellites um, are Terra and Aqua. And as we mentioned, MODIS is the sensor we're going to look at. Um, so MODIS also provides in, uh, observations in optical and infrared bands, just like Landsat. But as you can see, uh, this is a, a daily a polar orbiting satellite which provides daily or twice daily coverage. Um, compared to Landsat, which provides every 16 days. Terra has equator crossing time of 10.30 a.m. Um, and Aqua has 1.30 p.m. So at any location, observations are available from Terra at 10.30 a.m. and p.m. or from Aqua at 1.30 a.m. and p.m. And these are long-term flying satellites, as you can see. Uh, MODIS is a versatile instrument that observes surface, atmosphere, um, and uh, land and ocean both. Uh, has 36 bands in optical and infrared bands. Uh, what you notice here is that the resolution is not as high as Landsat. It's moderate. It's 250 meters to one kilometer, depending on the band. But the swath width is quite large, about 2,330 kilometers compared to 185 kilometers for Landsat. So you can see that there is a good coverage from MODIS. Um, the temporal resolution, it's one to two times a day, but there are composite data available at multiple time scales as listed here. Uh, this uh, figure just shows different spectral bands here. And uh, data sets can be obtained from Land Processing Distributed Active Archive Center, as shown here. This is the LPDAC website, and there is a data discovery uh, uh, link that you can find data information. And for data search, uh, temporal and spatial subsetting and downloading, you can go to uh, NASA Earth data site. 
this allows you to uh, look at a particular Modis product um, that you can get more information from LPDAC and then get that from NASA Earth data as shown here. So reflectance data are available as well as CRAD products are available here too. Next satellites we want to talk about is SNPP. Um, this is also a polar orbiting uh, satellite with 130 AM PM aqua type equator crossing time uh, with global coverage. It also has a multiple um, sensor suite, but we're going to talk about where's. And here is um, the the rears or visible infrared imaging radiometer suite. So similar to MODIS, observations in um, optical and infrared, there is a special day-night band, which is centered at 0.7 micrometer or between 0.5 to 0.9 micrometer. This band helps looking at nightlight imagery as shown here. And um, as you can see here also, there's a, a very wide swath um, and resolution is lower than MODIS, uh, 375 to 750 meter resolution. And this has been flying since 2011. Again, LPDAC provides information and data access for WIRS as well, just like MODIS. But what, why is it useful for urban flooding? As shown here, this DNB, as it's called, day-night band, uh, that provides information about night light. And so daily images, if you look at this band, uh, you can see if there are power outages uh, in urban areas. So this example is for Puerto Rico, uh, and this was last year during Hurricane Maria. And you can see that this was before hurricane and this was after hurricane. And you can clearly see uh, the decrease in intensity. And if you zoom in, you can see where uh, actually power outages have occurred. So that's why this is a very useful band. And various nightlight imagery is available uh, here in NASA Worldview. Um, and if you go to this website and search for nightlight imagery, you will be able to get the image. You can also see that uh, if there are clouds, sometimes it can uh, obscure, but there is a data set coming out uh, which has cloud cleared night imagery uh, that can be very useful for monitoring um, power outages that may occur because of urban flooding or uh, heavy precipitation. Next, uh, Soil Moisture Active Passive, or SMAP. This is also a polar orbiting global coverage satellite launched in 2015. Um, it had both microwave radiometer and radar, uh, but radar currently is unavailable. Uh, only radiometer is available, and it provides uh, soil moisture uh, information uh, globally. It has uh, if you can see that the resolution is, for radar is three kilometer, for radiometer it is uh, 40 kilometer. So uh, if the, after processing, what you can get is soil moisture, um, and this is useful for flood monitoring. And why? Because if there is already soil moisture, uh, or if there is rain and soil is saturated. Then more rain will prevent water to infiltrate because it's already saturated with soil moisture. And so more soil moisture already on the ground, there is chances of flooding are being more. So that um, monitoring soil moisture allows to anticipate what kind of intensity there will be of flooding, um, how efficiently water will either infiltrate or run off, that depends on um, amount of soil moisture present. So that's why uh, these data are very useful. So not only for just statistically, empirically looking at the data, but also in flood modeling, these data provide important boundary condition. And where to get SMAP data? Um, there is a uh, National Snow and Ice Data Center that provides soil moisture. Um, so level two to level four, so these are raw orbital data and also gridded data 
they are all available from NSIDC. So to look at, uh, to get these data, um, you can, um, here also you can have a spatial and temporal subsetting and uh, you can obtain the data. Finally, so there is um, European Space Agency's uh, satellite Sentinel uh, 1A and 1B. They carry synthetic aperture radar. And so that um, instrument is an active sensor. So that throws a uh, microwave pulse to the surface, as shown here. And then it, it measures the backscatter radiation. And that radiation is affected by the smoothness or type of surface. So the backscattered signal, after some processing, provides information about um, uh, what kind of surface there is, uh, if there is inundation going on. Uh, so that's why these data, uh, the backscatter signal, are useful. And uh, the scale of the objects on the surface that the uh, relative to the wavelength, wavelength that is very important to to derive information. So so actually SAR processing is a little complex, but um, one in, important advantage of SAR is that it's microwave based, not optical or infrared based as MODIS or Landsat uh, sensors, so that it can see through clouds. Uh, whenever there are clouds present, optical and infrared data uh, cannot see the surface through the clouds, but microwave can. So SAR that way is quite useful. And as you can see, there are multiple uh, applications of SAR as shown here. So SAR data can be accessed from um, Vertex, this is the Alaska Satellite Facility website. Um, here you can get these data. There are also um, uh, data processing tools. One of them is SNAP, or Sentinel-1 Application Toolbox. This is also available from Vertex. Um, and it is an open source toolbox that allows you to download and analyze uh, SAR data. Uh, here, you can go here also to download SNAP. Um, processing SAR images, as I mentioned, is complex and it requires advanced training, but it is also very useful uh, for monitoring surface. Um, and RSET is uh, hosting a webinar on SAR in August, and here is the website where you can go and register. The this will be an advanced training where you will be able to work with SAR data uh, for different applications. Then we talked about uh, Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM, which is shown here. It's a C-band radar as shown here. It also uh, throws radiation on Earth's surface and then receives backscattered radiation. And it is measured in such a way that uh, difference between that um, helps in deciding structure of the topography on the surface. So this was this flew in uh, Space Shuttle Endeavour, and it covered entire Earth in 176 orbits uh, between 60 north and 56 south uh, latitude bands, and it covers 80 percent the Earth's mass and provides topography over this um, entire area. And so this elevation maps, uh, they can be very useful in looking at terrain and slopes. Um, there was, here is a link where you can uh, get more information about um, SRTM um, data and its validation and its access, etc. So that's just for your more information, but we are also going to look at SRTM data for selected urban cases, flood cases. Here is a um, site which provides access to SRTM data. It's called Global Data Explorer from USGS, and it has multiple uh, choices as you can zoom in, you can define region either by box, state, country, or let latitude, longitude. Um, and you can download this data. There are multiple choices. NASA SRTM 30 meter resolution um, is uh, 
available here that uh, you can download. We'll have a short demo at the end to see how to do that. Then we talked about uh, model data. And here is the Geos file weather data. Um, this uh, is the website. And these are the variables available. So precipitation and sea level pressure are there. There is wind speed. And there is also humidity. Um, there are different re predefined regions, such as uh, North America or global or Australia or uh, Pacific. So you can zoom into any particular region and you can look at uh, sea level pressure and precipitation maps or you can see winds as uh, shown here, both speed and direction according to uh, uh, typical uh, weather map is here. There is a way you can download this data. You can either just visually see this uh, there is also a way to animate this data online. But you can download any data uh, using this data access um, HTTPS, uh, HTTPS um, option. Uh, you can, you once you go there, you will see different uh, data options. And so this is by year and month, GEOS data. Then you can pick a day, and then there are hourly files in near real time as well as hourly forecast up to 10 days are available from this particular site. You can download this data using um, uh, this portal. Uh, this is the uh, NCCS portal where you can download this data. Um, and uh, once you go to this site, um, there are two, there are single level files. They provide, um, um, sea level pressure and uh, wind data, whereas near surface, whereas uh, flux file provides precipitation information. Um, and there is more information about GEOS 5, file convention, and different parameters that are given here. So this is a lot of, lot of information from different data sets, but when we do a case study, you will see how we use these different data sets to look at urban flooding. The next ancillary data set that we talked about was CDAC or socioeconomic data. This is available from this uh, Columbia University uh, website or CDAC site. It has a number of uh, data sets which can be useful uh, for risk reduction in urban areas. So it knows it provides global population density. Uh, it has global urban data from Landsat satellite that we're going to see next week. Uh, global reservoir and dam information, low level, uh, low elevation coastal zone regions, uh, global roads, energy infrastructures. These are some of the uh, data sets that can help in focusing um, to see how to, uh, when there's urban flooding going on, if, you know, how to mitigate uh, around these uh, infrastructure um, or where there is more population. And so these socioeconomic data, they help in, in risk reduction and planning for flood management. So this is the list we started with earlier. So urban flood related data. Um, and so we talked about floodplain map. These are the data needs. They can come from SRTM and LIDAR. Uh, River stage, stream flow, surface inundation, they can be found based on Trim GPM. Um, and also, there's a tool, it's called Global Flood Monitoring System that uses precipitation, which we are going to see next week. There's Terra Aqua Modis and Landsat, they all help in deciding surface inundation. Coastal surges and surface inundation can also be they can also be seen from Terra Aqua and Landsat, so Modis and Landsat instruments. Uh, weather data, historical, current, and forecast. Um, so precipitations available from Trim and GPM and other weather parameters as we saw, including precipitation available from Geos 5 model as well. Uh, flood hazard map and written period, which um, be, uh, which are used for management, they can be based on past data. So trim and GPM data can be used. Uh, GEOS 5 model data can also be used to derive hazard map and also uh, return period uh, statistically. 
Land use change and exposed soil versus built area can be found from Landsat and MODIS because they uh, provide uh, land cover or land remote sensing. Uh, human population and infrastructure. So all the data sets that we just saw uh, right now, all the satellites, all the sensors, all the websites where data can be accessed, they can be used for these um, different needs for urban flood um, risk reduction for planning. Um, and so we will see a couple of cases where we put all these two all the data sets together to see how they can be used. Before we do that, though, uh, let's see some examples where some of these data are already used for applications. So one uh, such use is by Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, or ADPC. This center is um, uh, aided by NASA uh, US um, aid. And there is a surveyor, Mekong, a surveyor also is a NASA capacity building program. So this is a collaborative program that uh, provides a capability for monitoring flooding in Mekong Basin and how to reduce risk, uh, how to manage. And so you can see this is their annual report uh, that provides information about how remote sensing data are used um, in, in, by ADPC for decision making. And so there are all the um, uh, lower Mekong uh, countries data set needs are met by some of these uh, data sets that we just talked about. You can see on the right hand side, um, this is the area, this is the Mekong River, and this is the um, area around Phnom Penh in 2013 and 15. And you can see this inundated area uh, based on remote sensing observations that we just talked about. Uh, so ADPC works with a number of end users listed here, uh, which include National Heritage Institution, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, um, their Ministry of Environment and Meteorology and Water Resources are involved as end users. Um, there are Ministry of Engine, Energy and Mining, um, Thailand Department of Water Resources, Mekong River Commission, and World uh, Wildlife Fund. Uh, Greater Mekong, all these end users use ADPC um, information coming from Landsat 7 and 8, SRTM digital elevation, and MODIS data uh, to look at surface inundation, identify flood, flood prone area, and more information can be found from Surveyor Mekong products and services summary um, given here. So this is one example where data, remote sensing data, are actually used for decision making by several end users. Uh, NASA, World, uh, NASA and World Bank also, they have um, collaborated in looking at um, rapid flood response. And this is, um, this is again, uh, GPM data. And so World Bank uses uh, GPM precipitation data to monitor uh, heavy precipitation and resulting flooding. As quoted here, uh, it says, these preliminary results we have seen are promising and options to combine satellite-based measurements with traditional hydrologic model-based approaches are being explored. So um, in long term, the objective is for, for any disaster planning or relief, it's, it's very important to combine remote sensing data with traditional in situ data and also modeling. And NASA and World Bank also uh, have put together a ebook that you can look at at your convenience. Um, this is also based on trim and GPM. Uh, flood potential is available through this ebook. This is open source. And you can see uh, near real time flooding, uh, areas where there is severe or moderate flooding or low level flooding going on that can be seen from this ebook. There is also other information in this ebook about uh, remote sensing data used for a number of applications. Next user is Red Cross. Uh, their disaster mapping um, also uses trim data. And they also now use, uh, we will be using GPM data. So American Red Cross uses precipitation data, 
precipitation data and flood monitoring tools uh, for hazard mapping and trim has uh, been a very major part of this uh, disaster mapping. Um, one more example here is uh, Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation. Their floodplain management, they use NASA Disaster Portal as uh, shown here. And you, this, uh, this portal is being developed for different uh, disasters and floods also is a major part of it. And so um, for VA Department of Conservation and Recreation, for floodplain management, they use data available from remote sensing uh, and different flood monitoring tools coming out of, um, of NASA. Uh, FEMA also uses some of the remote sensing measurements we just talked about for flood floodplain management, and you can find more information here. Um, so um, resources from different federal, state, and professional association that include NASA data, and uh, includes precipitation and MODIS data map, and also this is the Sentinel uh, flood map. All the red area shown here shows surface inundation. This is in Ohio and Mississippi River uh, region. So um, for identifying uh, and managing floodplain, FEMA uses uh, remote sensing data. So this brings us to uh, the demonstration of uh, flood cases. So we're going to focus today on precipitation and terrain data to look at flood prone, to identify a flood prone area. And we're going to focus on two urban flood cases. First one, as I mentioned, is Ellicott City, Maryland. This is of, on 27th May. There was a flash flood. Uh, we're going to focus on that. And the second one was on 4th of July in Houston. That also resulted from heavy rain. So what we are going to do is, so this is an overview of Ellicott City um, flooding. So on 27th May, here is the um, this is the Washington Post reported. This is the area where there was, this is Ellicott City, there was major, major flash flood occurred because in short time, there was a lot of precipitation. As you can see, uh, six inches uh, fell in Ellicott City proper right there. And then there is decreasing intensity. This is a radar based image. Um, if you see on the right hand side, this uh, area is the flooded area which is called Main Street and what you see here is this is the Patapsco River and there are several um, uh, streams here like Hudson Branch is there, there is Tiber Branch and then there is Newcut Branch. All these streams flow into the river but it's the topography plus the amount of rain that fell um, uh, river stages went up very dramatically. All the stream uh, flow was very high in these streams. And because of the terrain in this area and also development, urban development around this region, there was no way of that water to go away quickly. And so quickly a lot of uh, water accumulated in this main street area and a lot of damage occurred. So we will look at this case uh, when we uh, look at GPM precipitation and we also look at a certain terrain. Uh, Houston flood, um, this is also um, a major rain system uh, arrived on 4th of July bringing more than 200 millimeter rain in certain areas and so especially Harris County area all the streets were flooded. So we will focus on this uh, flood as well to see how we can monitor arriving rain system and also see if we can look at SRTM to identify where there could be more flooding because of terrain. And so uh, I will share my screen with you. So here is, I'm, I'm sharing my screen now with you. And what we will see is, first we will see how to look at GPM IMERS data for Ellicott City, 
how we can analyze the data by using Giovanni and followed by uh, SRTM data for the same region. So this is the Giovanni website and there's a search by keyword where we are going to say iMerge and we're going to pick iMerge early because that has the lowest latency in time and available in near real time. Once you search that, it comes up with this table of all the data available in early iMerge, and source, temporal resolutions, special resolutions, and uh, data coverage dates. And we're going to pick half hourly data. Units are millimeter per hour. You can have inch per hour if you like. We're going to pick this half hourly data. And here is an option where you can put uh, latitude, longitude, you can enter. And we're going to choose coordinates based on um, location of Ellicott City, Maryland. And this is the box around Ellicott City, a little larger area just to see how precipitation systems uh, came over the, the Ellicott City region. You can also pick a shape file in which you can pick US states, uh, such as Maryland, you can pick. But we are just going to look at a box, which is around Ellicott City. You can zoom in and pan the map using uh, so this is the area where we want to look at rainfall. We're going to pick dates now. So we're going to pick 27th of May, because that was the, the day when floods were occurred. You can see the hours. Um, this is 00. Uh, this is in UTC to uh, 2359. This is the end of the day for 27th. And here are all the options. We are going to pick animation. We're going to animate half hourly rainfall for this day to see how rain systems moved. You can do plot data and it launches a workflow to, uh, for animation of rainfall. To save time, we already have put this uh, animation together. And here is the, these are the arrows you can look at. And you can see all the rain systems moving in this area. This is the general area where flash flood occurred. Here is every half hour interval for 27th of May. You can use the arrows to stop and go back and forth and look at individual frames. Here is where heavy rain occurred. So after 6 o'clock on uh, 27th, these are going backwards now looking at um, past. So this is 8 o'clock, 8.30, 8 o'clock. So this is when there was um, heavy rain arriving in this region. So now we can go back to the data selection again because we now seen uh, we have seen now uh, how uh, rain systems were moving in this area. Now we are picking a specific point based on that animation map, which is close to uh, Ellicott City Center. This is one uh, grid point from iMerge, and we are going to do time series analysis for the same day. So now at this grid point, we are going to see time series of rainfall, half hourly rainfall. And once you uh, do the selection and do the time series plot, here's the plot at this particular location. As I mentioned, the resolution is one tenth of a degree or about 10 kilometers. So in 10 kilometer box, rainfall increased after six o'clock that evening and peaked around nine o'clock. And then there was another small minor peak later in, in that night. Um, four millimeter per hour is the maximum rain noted here. This is just one grid point. If you look at surrounding grid points one by one, you can see the intensity of rainfall in this each one tenth of a degree box. You can download this data or you can save the image and you can further analyze this for uh, this particular hours. And that's what uh, we're doing here. Now, uh, what we've gone back to data selection. And what we've done is picked six o'clock to end of the day. And we are, what we're going to do is because we saw that that's when the rain peaked and the flash flood occurred very much after that. 
we're going to look at accumulated rainfall for this hours again for the same region in around Ellicott City and once you select that and you plot the data you get a map of accumulated rainfall and you can see that this is the scale here uh, maximum is about 44 millimeters in in after six o'clock that day and you can see um, where um, you can see all the one tenth degree boxes this is relatively a low resolution data but what we can do is we can uh, download this data and then use it with QGIS or any other GIS the data are available as netcdf file uh, we can save that to further analyze in GIS or we can save a PNG image uh, uh, just to, to look at visually how the rainfall was distributed so next so what we have done is already saved this accumulated precipitation we will use that um, in GIS to see how it was distributed uh, over around Ellicott City uh, next what we want to see is the terrain data and here is um, just a little demo for that this is the USGS GDAX site that allows um, data selection uh, for SRTM. What you need to know is that uh, you have to log in to get this data. And you have to register uh, to NASA Earth data. Once you uh, go there, you if you you can register or if you already have registered you can log in with your username and password so this site is free but user registration is required so for downloading data you have to log in you can visualize uh, the map without um, logging in just if you want to look at the data you can see that you can zoom in and out you can pan the map you can draw a box and zoom in or just go back and look at the global view you can refresh your screen and go back and forth in your uh, frame selection here is the area defined by either country or states you can pick any particular country um, if you just want to focus on that or you can go to um, US map and uh, pick states and even counties you can pick so in here all the states are available and you can also pick um, county if you know where you want to focus you can have a rectangular area defined by latitude longitude you can have a polygon area selection or rectangular area selection you can refresh your uh, defined area and finally you can download so these are multiple options also note that when you move your cursor um, you can see which latitude longitude are, are at so you can just visualize data if you don't want to download in here we are going to download uh, SRTM terrain data for Ellicott City and so the, these are the um, latitude and longitudes around Ellicott City so you can pick exact latitude longitude that you're interested in and here is the area that we've picked and you can see that this is NASA SRTM one arc second which is 30 meter so once you click on that it loads the data there is a legend uh, here is in meter it's in elevation so this can give you a rough idea qualitatively you can see what range is there uh, in elevation on this area but we're going to look at it in QGIS to have a better idea of how terrain distribution is around Ellicott City. You can pick um, other um, uh, different countries or boundaries and cities. You can highlight that on the map. You can download data. Here you can pick SRTM, one arc second, which is 30 meter resolution data. And you can download the data as GeoTIFF images. Once you submit that, um, it extracts the data that you picked 
and you can save it and saves on your computer. And so once the file is created, you can visually see how train is distributed. And now what uh, we are going to do is actually look at the analysis in QGIS. So bear with me while I launch this. So this is the Ellicott City uh, region. I have um, iMERGE data um, included in here. So you can see that data are a little boxy. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to do um, actually interpolation of this data that allows you to not create new information but provides higher resolution information. Um, and so for that, we are going to use that interpolation tool. This is a grass tool available in QGIS. And you can use this um, tool. You can do bilinear interpolation based on uh, this one tenth of a degree. And we are going to pick about 30 meter resolution here too. Uh, and we can run this to see a high resolution uh, uh, resampled uh, precipitation data. Uh, you can you can do uh, color change here uh, according to I'm going to invert this red blue and have uh, interval say about 10. So it's about four millimeter intervals and you can see where there were hot spots or uh, a lot of rain occurred. You can make this layer transparent to see um, what's underneath. And so what you see here is um, here is where you can also look at slope that um, we had. This is the this is Baltimore, and we are going to try and zoom into Ellicott City so we can see both terrain and map. And zoom in a little more and turn the terrain on. So this is what I've done actually is calculated slope based on uh, terrain data, SRTM terrain data. So we got the terrain data and yeah, and then use the oh, sorry, Need to zoom in. Sorry about that. Let me zoom in again. This is a little tricky, uh, but we just need to. Get, I want to show you that Main Street area and see how the terrain looks. So this is the uh, Main Street that passed through Ellicott City. And if you look at the slope here, derived from SRTM terrain, and that is derived from raster analysis, DM terrain models. And here you can pick slope, uh, and you can pick um, uh, terrain data, which uh, you can include in your layer, and then calculate slope. So this is in degree. Uh, you can see that in general. So these are the streams that we saw earlier that go into Patapsco River here. But notice here that this main street part, this is the historic Ellicott City, which uh, suffered a lot of flash flood. There are high terrain slope area surrounded here in the main street area, which is the low slope area. There are buildings here, and in general, the terrain is high in here. You can also see that in general, the slopes are low. So anywhere 
you have higher sloping surface and low slope in between. The, these are flood plone areas. And in here, it is just like a channel that you have all these uh, high terrain and buildings around. And there's the street that goes through it. When there's a lot of rain, there's no way to remove this uh, water quickly. And so this is the second time in two years that a very damaging flood has occurred in this area. You can now look at the rainfall. What you see here is that although this we have interpolated at higher resolution, really it is the um, it's around 12 to uh, 16 millimeter rainfall. It shows everywhere. So now if you have this low resolution rainfall, but you have high resolution terrain data, uh, you can, first of all, identify uh, what area are flood prone based on the slope um, and terrain analysis. And then uh, based on past flooding, or if you have in situ rainfall data, you can derive a relationship between iMERGE high resolution data and in situ data. And if you have flooding information from earlier uh, flood cases, you can come up with a strategy that, okay, here is the satellite derived rainfall, and here is uh, my train, how intense the flood is going to be, what, what is going to be the probability based on past cases combined with some in situ data. So uh, although precipitation available from, from GPM here for such smaller urban area like Ellicott City, it, it's not high resolution, but combining it with in situ data if you have any, if you have stream gauge data, if you have rain gauge data, and if you have this high resolution um, slope data, you can come up with a strategy um, and some idea to facilitate your decision where there will be more flooding or likelihood of more flooding. So this is uh, one way to look at uh, these two data sets. Next week, what we're going to do is uh, look at um, inundation monitoring tool using MODIS. Uh, also, um, Erica Podes from JPL will be talking about SAR uh, urban flooding. For Ellicott City area, we'll, we'll see whether MODIS can show us any flooding. Um, so we'll, we'll cover that next week, and we'll do further GIS analysis to combine more data. Um, I just wanted to quickly, I did the same for Houston. And so this is the Houston uh, area. I, I have resampled uh, iMERGE data here. Uh, and there is slope based on uh, SRTM data also. Um, you can zoom in and see within the city. This is pretty high rainfall in, in, in Houston region, almost 108 millimeter accumulated. This is just one day, 4th of July. And just if you look at the slope, again, in the city area, you can see um, streets and other um, buildings, and they appear as higher slope region. And then in between, streets show up as low slope area. So this helps you um, in seeing um, as Especially, but you can also uh, look at the uh, terrain data itself to see uh, if there is um, any indication of there is a high um, elevation plateau in certain regions, so there is a slope in general in certain direction, uh, or you can just um, combine again um, uh, GPM iMERGE, which is resampled with um, slope data to see where there is likelihood of. Uh, flooding in which area. So like in between, uh, you would see uh, if there is likelihood of more flooding. Again, um, you, in situ data always helps in these cases. So combining remote sensing uh, and in situ data, uh, uh, especially if you do it for past flood cases, uh, that helps you uh, come up with a decision support um, uh, strategy uh, and to identify where there is more likelihood of flooding. So this is uh, a quick uh, demonstration uh, of rainfall and terrain. Lastly, I want to show this weather map, which is the forecast map. As we talked earlier, uh, it's not just near real-time data that we're interested in for urban flooding, but if you have forecast, that helps in, in, in focusing on in certain areas. So this is 
even lower resolution, about like 30 to 50 kilometer boxes. So it's it's low resolution. But if you look at the map, these uh, colors are three hourly accumulation uh, accumulated precipitation, and that's what you see in here. Uh, what you see is that you can pick um, forecast initial time and lead hour. So you can say uh, today we are in the 24th of July, but uh, 25th of July, we can go to say 27th of July, about 21Z. And uh, you can actually animate the data. We have picked North America. You can zoom into other regions as well. Um, when you when you launch this animation, it takes a few minutes uh, to actually see the data. But then, once all the images are put together, uh, you should be able to see uh, animation between these dates. And that shows moment of uh, precipitation. And that helps you uh, see uh, in in next few days, hour by hour, how uh, precipitation, precipitation systems might move into certain uh, area. So here you can see this um, larger precipitation is here, blue, red. Um, so it, it allows you to focus on where there is more rain, it keeps looping. So and then you, as you come closer to that time, you can start monitoring uh, I merge data uh, in near real time, um, as we saw. So this 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 provides guidance in which area to focus on, uh, where there may be flood likely, where there is rain system arriving, and then as it comes closer to uh, the area when closer to this date, then you can uh, time, then you can start looking at I merge data in near real time to see how um, the flooding might occur or where it might occur. So this um, ends our demonstration, and we are going back to the presentation now. Flooding is the most common and most costly natural disaster in the country. In the last two years, more than 8.5 billion in damages more than 130 lives lost. How many are there of you? Uh, there's a bus over there, 40. In yeah. the bus? The question is what can we do to mitigate this destruction? The firm, as they call it, a flood insurance rate map, is a panel uh, which depicts flood zones, and these flood zones give an idea of specific risk, how likely you may or may not be to encounter a flooding event within a given period of time. These maps need to be updated because the factors upon which the engineering is based change over time. You have uh, changes in the, the composition of the ground material. You may have an increase in impervious area. Uh, you may have better methods, better flood study methods may become available. One of the ways to keep these FEMA maps up to date is by tracking urban change using satellite imagery. Take this suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. If we look at Landsat images spanning a 27-year period, we can pinpoint areas of the Earth's surface that have changed, usually because of construction, like here, where the Mall of Georgia was built. A product called NUSI helps to mine these images. Well, NUSI is uh, especially important when considering risk because it allows us to identify trends in urbanization. Now, if you identify areas where urban change is accelerating, there are consequences. It means you're, you're, that increase in impervious area is going to mean altered flood characteristics, likely, and increased risk because people are probably building houses there. Impervious area essentially means ground cover which has been changed from a natural state to, say, a paved area, which is going to be concrete or asphalt the infiltration characteristics of that ground material have been altered significantly, such that the ground is no longer able to hold water, which means that, that local flooding sources are going to receive more of that water, and the flooding characteristics are going to change. Tracking urban change from space helps everyday people understand their flood risk and take action.
You can't see them or hear them, but since 1972, Landsat satellites have been sending us data. And today, that data helps us manage the high cost of flooding here on Earth. Just a small demo of this uh, urban land characteristics changing, and we are going to look at um, this data. Uh, for the current period, what the impermeable surface data are, we'll look at it next week. So what we're going to do next week is we'll, we'll also look at um, synthetic aperture radar, and we'll see how that is advantageous um, of, for flood uh, monitoring. Uh, we will also have examples of LIDAR data. We talked about uh, briefly, LIDAR today, which also provides terrain data, high-resolution uh, terrain data uh, over uh, urban areas. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about urban area. We'll talk about uh, flood mapping tools, specifically based on MODIS and also based on TrimGPM. And we'll have some other socioeconomic data uh, to see how all these information can be combined together uh, in an urban area to uh, to facilitate decision making uh, in different stages during flooding. So this actually brings us to the end of today's presentation and demonstrations. But there is an uh, exercise that you can um, take a few minutes to follow. In the handouts part, you will see exercise one. And you can see that over here, it's the monitoring GPM average precipitation for flood monitoring. So this is something for you to get hands-on um, experience a little bit. So we'll give you a few minutes, um, say 10 minutes or so, and then we can um, go back to our question answer session before we end today's session. So we'll take a couple of more minutes um, and see if you have, uh, if you encounter any problems with Giovanni tool or if it is, you can do it later also. You can download the exercise now or you can also download from our website later on. So uh, you, you probably have some idea of using um, Giovanni now. The last part of the exercise uh, talked about uh, looking at PMM site. This is the this is where you look at IMERGE data in latest half hourly not period. You can click on it, and you can go to here is where you can see where rainfall is occurring. You can zoom in where the rain is in which region. Zoom in further if you like. And what you can see here is view an animation of the past seven days of high-merge precipitation. So this is also helpful. It allows you to look at the region where persistent rainfall has been occurring, such as in, say, monsoon region currently over here. For several days now, it's been raining, and the rain system's been moving here also. So you can look at it and, and try and anticipate where there may be uh, flooding, so based on animation. So this gives you qualitative idea of where there is high precipitation intensity um, and how uh, rainfall may have accumulated over a particular region in the area of your interest. Okay, so with that, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll start with uh, our question and answer session. So here are some of the questions uh, that we have from you. So the, um, this was the um, question, how there are different scales of mapping and remote sensing different sources, how would you combine them? So one way actually is to uh, do the analysis like we did, and we're going to continue to do that next week also. 
to put more and more data together to, to facilitate uh, better analysis. Uh, you can use different data sets in the hydrologic model and uh, then look at uh, outputs. The, uh, here, um, the data are available. Giovanni works um, for all countries. So we, we just saw the demo here, this question three, for a particular flood incident, how do we decide cap capturing data? So uh, we looked at Giovanni and GDAX today. We also looked at GEOS5 portal for um, for weather forecast. And next week, then, we're going to look at some other tools, uh, especially for inundation mapping and looking at stream flow and runoff. So the question four is, how does forest cover affect SMAP data. So um, SMAP radar, I mean, it can look um, because it, it, uh, radar, if radar is there, it could see through it. But right now, radar is not working. And so the radiometer data, uh, that is um, an effect on, of forest cover. But next week, we'll see that synthetic aperture radar data, they can um, map uh, soil measure even when there is forest cover. Uh, so uh, for now, yes, um, SMAP has, you, you can get um, soil moisture data, but it has, it has influence of forest cover. There's also a modeling product available in which SMAP data are, are assimilated, and that provides um, perhaps better representation of soil moisture everywhere. So question five is written period uh, of trim and GPM. So GPM and trim written period core satellites um, have um, repeat period, which is in hours to a couple of days for trim, and GPM is a few hours. but what the product that we talked about, um, TMPA for trim and iMERGE, which will be the, the future of uh, respiration product like iMERGE, that is a combination of multiple satellites. And so it is every half hour. So all the constellation satellites um, are calibrated with GPM core data. And so data are available at have every half hour at one tenth of a degree resolution. So um, Servier Mekong data, um, I think uh, you can contact Servier. You may have to register uh, to download the data. They can help um, in answering your questions. Um, so the, the question here is, are we uh, focusing on any kind of hydraulic modeling? Um, not in this webinar. So identifying flood hazard using QGIS, uh, yes, a little bit of that. Uh, we are going to be putting different remote sensing data in GIS to actually be able to do better decisions. Yes. But modeling is not part of this webinar, this being an introductory webinar. If there is an interest, you can let us know at the end of the webinar session when there will be a brief survey. So question eight, um, answer is um, actually yes, because if you look at um, past data over a particular region of your interest, uh, where you already know when floods occurred, um, you have in situ data, 
and you can try and correlate with satellite data from the past. And based on that, you will be able to um, decide. Uh, you can once you look at forecast rainfall, you can uh, look at uh, you you can have a forecast possibility for flood. Um, yes, iMERGE data can be um, downloaded as TIFF image. Um, you, the PMM site that we just uh, saw, that, that has a training uh, on how to get in different for, uh, iMERGE data from different locations. I'm to find this. Uh, The link for you. So that uh, provides uh, here also there is registration required, but you should be able to look at our webinars how to get and in the chat box I'm just putting a, a link. Uh, Are any of these data sources exposing the data via open uh, APIs? So again, yes, iMERGE data are available uh, through open applications. And um, uh, since you asked, we, we will actually cover it next week briefly. So how accurate are these data when relating them to terrestrial data for meteorological stations? And if it can be taken as a forecast or prediction for official information or will? Yes. I, I think local uh, validation is highly recommended. As for a, when you look at a meteorological station data, a rain gauge data, and if you have uh, satellite data which is tens of kilometers, um, there is not going to be a direct match. If you see a time series, you can uh, do bias correction between in situ data and satellite data. And that has been done um, uh, by, by many groups so that they use satellite data and then remove bias based on local station data. So that gives them better idea of how to interpret satellite data at local level. So that has to be done. Um, sometimes uh, when you look at a large area uh, like iMERGE looks at 10 kilometers, uh, rain intensity would be much less than a station data sometimes. But that is something, that, that bias correction is, is important. If you actually want to do any quantitative analysis, yes. Um, it, so yes, actually you can go to uh, Giovanni and you can pick any region you know, upstream of your area and there is a whole time series. You can look at past data. So you can be, uh, you can start following back and see if there is upstream rain and you would expect any flooding um, in your region because of that. So that is, that, that is um, possible. So you use the area, special area, and temporal range. And then you can animate, you can accumulate. You can look at time series analysis. Um, uh, the, the question, like question 13, um, buildings do uh, pose a problem, yes. Uh, backscatter, uh, it is affected. But we'll see that when we look at SAR um, session next week. Uh, 
Uh, Geos data is available globally. And uh, as we saw on the website, you can zoom into a particular region. You can go on the website that we have in the presentation and download global data. If you just want to uh, have, we want to do special selection, um, there is a way of, in, in the NASA Earth Data website that um, we, uh, we mentioned in the presentation. I'm trying to understand question 15. Uh, date range for daily accumulated rainfall. Since we cannot choose beginning and end time increments. So um, time zone is basically, this is all the UTC. Um, these are all GMT time. So your local time, you have to adjust that way if you are interested in that. But um, you can pick beginning and end time. Um, you can pick different dates. You can pick different hours within dates. If it is like for iMERGE, it's half hourly data, so you can pick which which time you want to to see. So there is a way to pick beginning and end. Uh, SMAP data has not stopped operating. The radar is not working. Radiometer is there. And it, if you're if it, it is useful, just to uh, if you. If you are looking at a particular area, if you, again, resolution is a little low, but if you look at, keep looking at soil moisture maps, and that tells you that uh, before, uh, like, uh, approaching weather, if you are monitoring soil moisture, it will give you some idea. If there is more soil moisture, there is less infiltration, maybe more possibility of flooding or water logging. So it can help that way, but more importantly, if you're using hydrologic model, you can use SMAP data as a boundary condition. Yes, so here, um, both Landsat and Sentinel-2 data will be available. So resolution could be 10 meters in that case. So it's slightly better than what we have now. Uh, you also have to see that uh, Landsat and Sentinel, the revisit time is not daily, so you might miss um, some some flood cases. That's why uh, we use MODIS, although it is lower resolution, it is daily data. So yes, you're not able to look at the um, roads which are uh, which are not very wide and are surrounded by buildings. One way to to get around is is to have uh, lidar data or LiDAR images of urban area, which can help you identify uh, buildings and narrow roads also. And that way you actually have um, all your drainage channels and um, slopes and everything identified before you see rain. And then you can look at Landsat and Sentinel data superimposed, and that will give you a better idea of where flooding might be occurring. Even if the roads are narrow and you can't resolve that in Landsat Sentinel-2, you have LiDAR data to do some guidance. Um, question 18, uh, yes, um, all these data are available through FTP. That, 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 and we will actually, um, if you go to RSAT Tropical, uh, storm webinar. Um, I'm trying to give you the link here if I can. That has a, a tutorial on how to uh, subset data and download. Uh, I'm sorry, not the tropical, but the uh, hydrologic modeling webinar we did um, a few months ago. It was on variable infiltration capacity hydrologic model. And here's the link. So 
there were three sessions, but the second session in this webinar uh, that has um, NASA Earth Data tutorial that allows you to FTP data. Yes, iMERGE and TMPA combined will be uh, one-tenth of a degree half-hourly data uh, starting in January 1998, I believe. Should be available later this year. Um, question 20, yes, actually, uh, you can. Uh, I think it's a good idea to look at terrain data also. Is there any way to project the flood? Can you mention about MODIS and other satellite data? Yes. So this is a um, real challenge um, when when there is major storm passing through or rain system going through, there are clouds. And MODIS and Landsat, they both being optical instruments, cannot see through clouds. So that is why um, synthetic aperture radar data are slightly more useful. They're microwave data, and they can see through clouds. So we'll see next week some of the advantage of SAR data. Another way uh, people have uh, done that there are cloud clearance algorithms used. Um, sometimes if um, some more day compos composite data are used, rather than using daily data, you use maybe three to 10 day composite that uh, eliminates some of the cloud influence. But yes, that is a challenge. That is a problem. So just a couple of more points here before we adjourn for today. Um, Homework one, actually, there's no submission as such. You are actually downloading and, and installing QGIS on your computer. And there is also a exercise to for you to uh, work with SRTM data using GDAX. This is just for your, your own experience. You don't need to submit anything, but if you next week when we do exercise, um, you will be using QGIS, so it will help if you have QGIS on your computer. If you have, were not able to do exercise one today, you can try that. And if you have any questions with that, you can uh, ask them next week. So today we focus mostly on precipitation. Uh, we did not look at riverine flooding or even coastal flooding. So next week, when we look at flood monitoring tools, that provides information about if there is any uh, river flooding going on that might cause urban flooding. Um, you can see coastal inundation in certain cases. So we will see that. Something we are not addressing here is the snow melt issue. We are mostly focusing on flooding resulting from rainfall and, uh, and coastal um, flooding because of the storm occurring in, in nearby. So we also uh, want to ask the question if um, any of you are involved in urban flood management, um, your feedback would be very useful to us. 
So we have all these data sets, but actual decision making um, on ground, what kind of data are used, what kind of temporal latency um, is required, what kind of special resolution is helpful, um, and how actually decisions are made. If you can provide us feedback about that, that would be highly useful to us also. And if you are willing to talk to us offline, uh, we would be very happy to uh, set up a telecon with you. Since we talked about many different data sets today, um, and we went over all the satellite sensors model, in, not in great detail, but just in introductory fashion, if there is any particular um, topic that is of interest to you, you can make note of that. And at the end of the webinar series next week, we will have a survey for you in which you can express your interest or the topics that you are interested in learning in more detail. So if there are no more questions, we would like to thank you all very much for attending today's session. And we hope to see you uh, next week at the same time. And we'll be focusing more on uh, radar data as well as on flood monitoring tools. And I also want to thank uh, our RSET team helping here, uh, Brock Levins, Elizabeth Hook, and Selvin Hudson. They have been helping in setting up this webinar, answering questions and registration and um, making material available. So thank you, everyone. Thanks again for attending today's session, and we hope to see you next Wednesday, uh, 1st of August, the same time.